Well, next we have Wayne Motz, who will present Gettysburg Treasures in the National Civil War Museum. I'll tell you a little bit about Wayne. Wayne is the Chief Executive Officer of the National Civil War Museum in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, which opened in 2001. He was one of the youngest persons to become a licensed battlefield guide at Gettysburg National Military Park, where he's led tours for 25 years. <laughs> Wayne is the former director of the Adams County Historical Society, and he assisted the Lutheran Theological Seminary in rehabilitating Schmucker Hall, one of the country's most significant Civil War structures. Wayne served as the research historian for the renowned Civil War artist Dale Gallen of Gettysburg, helping to research 40 works of fine art. He's lectured and published widely on a wide variety of topics and is considered the leading authority on Southern General Lewis Addison Armistead of Pickett's Charge fame, publishing the only biography of the general, Trust in God and Fear Nothing, Lewis A. Armistead, CSA. Now I'm going to go off the script for a moment and say also, <clears throat> Wayne has been a tremendous help to the Gettysburg Foundation in helping us to open the George Spangler Civil War Field Hospital site here. He has been a tremendous research source for us, a consultant, and the, the impetus, the energy behind helping us do that as well. And we owe him a great debt that this year, this season, the George Spangler Farm Field Hospital site is open to all of you. So let us all please extend a warm sacred trust welcome to Wayne Motts. Well, good morning everyone. Let's see if this is on. You all can adjust the, the volume as uh, appropriate. I want to thank Cindy Small. I want to thank all the staff of the Gettysburg Foundation in the Gettysburg National Military Park. These folks have not slept for days. For those of you folks out in this audience, I think you probably know that. They've done tremendous work here to make your experience at Gettysburg for this 150th anniversary a very, very special time. I'm just honored that I can be part of that here uh, th this morning to speak to you about some things that are very dear and close to me. I'm going to have to beg your indulgence as I go forward here. First of all, I put this talk together specifically for this event. It has never been given before. Some of the items that you're going to see here on the screen have never been seen before outside the storage that we have at the um, National Civil War Museum up in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. So I also want to say that I'm pleased to have my father, who taught me everything I know about the Civil War, who drew me, took me to every single event. He has been out Dondle Dust. He's over here with his camera, and I want to just acknowledge my father, Warren, the man who taught me everything I know about the war. <laughs> so, Dad, I'm dedicating this to you uh, that's here. I... I got interested in the American Civil War because at age 14, my father was given a set of diaries related to a soldier that died in the attack at Fort Wagner, Morris Island, South Carolina. That soldier was killed July 18, 1863. His name was Aaron Thomas McNaughton, and he grew up near Lancaster, Ohio, which is the boyhood home of William Tecumseh Sherman, for many of you in this room or in this tent that may know that. My dad had this set of diaries given to, to him, and as a little boy, he would pull this out and read me the entries in that diary related to the Civil War. So I got interested because I had an actual artifact. I had a connection. I spent most of my professional career working in museums and working in archives. And so I'm gonna, we've got a two-fold purpose here today. First is to show you some great artifacts that we have at the National Civil War Museum, which are treasured artifacts. I got this idea because the foundation has done a wonderful exhibit here on Civil War treasures. If you haven't seen it, you need to go in and look at it. So the idea of doing a treasured um, uh, talk for me came from there. But my second goal here, besides showing you this, is to also tell you the importance of preserving artifacts from the Civil War. Most of us learn about the Civil War because we go to a classroom, either K to 12 or in college, and we are taught and we read out of a book. 
or in some cases today, from an iPad, because you don't have books, right, uh, related to the Civil War. We need preservation and education at many levels. The Civil War Trust does an excellent job preserving battlefields. This foundation has assisted in that. We also had the preservation of buildings. Cindy mentioned one of those, Schmucker Hall, which is an 1832 building where John Buford used for observation on July 1st, 1863. Our Civil War experience, ladies and gentlemen, would be greatly diminished if we could not go to Ford's Theater, see it and understand it, if it did not exist. To preserve a battlefield, what do you need? The first answer out there might be, well, we need money. Well, that's true. <laughs> You do. But you need the documents, you need the research, and you need artifacts to tell the story. You can't tell the story about Civil War battles if you have only preserved the ground. You can't tell the story of the Civil War if you have only preserved the buildings. My hope is when you think about preservation, you think at it at many levels today. Our understanding of the Civil War would be greatly diminished and in most parts, it wouldn't exist if we did not have tangible objects related to the war that we could go and see, and I dare say in some cases hold, because it's with that connection that we, that we learn. So what I'm going to show you today are going to be some of the rarest artifacts at the National Civil War Museum, about 40 miles north of here. And I've been the chief executive officer for about 13 months there having left the historic society here. And I can tell you, ladies and gentlemen, every day is Christmas for me, every single day. Something new the curator shows me related to the Civil War. Let me just tell you a little bit about who we are. The museum was constructed in the year 2000. It cost about $16 million. And most of the collection there was purchased by the city of Harrisburg to seed the museum that's there. I've worked at a lot of places. We only have the best items. We have the best of the best. So when we say we have five swords, guess what? We have two of them that belong to General Jeb Stuart in the Civil War. We have a sword that belonged to Joseph Kershaw in the Civil War, famous division commander uh, later on in the war, brigade commander here at Gettysburg. So that's the kind of quality of stuff. It's a 501c3 museum. It's 65,000 square feet. It contains 21,000 square feet of, of educational space, and we have about 25,000 items there, about 4,000 three-dimensional objects, and about 21,000 archival documents and photographs there. Almost all of the collection, we're still cataloging, has not been used. It has not been published or seen in most cases. We have 1,000 items out on permanent exhibit, and three-quarters of our items are in storage. And then we rotate those out when we're able to do a new exhibit. That's pretty good. Most museums can't display that much. We do pretty well there. We have two changing galleries. And our visitation up there uh, is relatively small compared to Gettysburg, about 40,000 folks a year. But we do have folks in 27 different countries and from 50 different states that come up and see us. And our mission is pretty simple. It's to serve as a national center to inspire lifelong learning of the American Civil War through the preservation and balanced presentation of the American people's struggle for survival and healing. That means we do both sides, north and south. That means we do the eastern and western theater of operations in the Civil War. That means we do civilian topics, African American topics, medical topics, prisoner of war topics. We do everything, not just the battles related to the Civil War. So it's extremely what I would call well-rounded as far as the presentation. And obviously we hope maybe when you leave here or when you're coming down here next time you'll come up and see us. And I'm going to show you some of the things that we have here. At the beginning of this Gettysburg campaign, in May of 1863, what did Robert E. Lee do? He went to go visit Jefferson Davis. You're Jefferson Davis, you're the President of the Confederacy, what do you want to do? possibly detach portions of Robert E. Lee's army from the Army of Northern Virginia and send them to Vicksburg, Mississippi. If you're Lee, you don't agree with that, but most of the Confederate cabinet does not take Lee's position. But in at least two meetings, Lee argues vigorously, I might add, and correctly, I believe, not to detach portions of his army away from Virginia, but to strike out in a bold maneuver. And that bold maneuver, ladies and gentlemen, for the summer of 1863, beginning in early June of that year, would be what you and I call the Gettysburg Campaign. Now, what do we know about Robert E. Lee? We know Robert E. Lee was a religious man, right? 
You think he went to Jefferson Davis' office without first praying, knowing what you know about Robert E. Lee? Probably not. Do you think he embarked at Gettysburg without praying or fought here without praying? Probably not. Well, one of the things he used, ladies and gentlemen, if I can get to it, is this Bible. This is Robert E. Lee's actual Bible. This Bible, Robert E. Lee secured in the Mexican War. He got it in September of 1847 as a young engineering officer attached to Winfield Scott's staff. He carried this Bible with him for the entire war until five days before the surrender at Appomattox. How do we know that? Well, the first thing we can do is look inside it and see at the very top of it, which I can't point to it, it actually has Robert E. Lee's signature. In his own hand, it says R. E. Lee, City of Mexico, September 1847. And he wrote that inscription inside there and kept it through the war. Now, how do we know it was used at Gettysburg? Well, a man named J. William Jones in his personal reminiscences of Robert E. Lee. By the way, that is the editor and publisher of the famed Southern Historical Papers. For those of you that are interested in materials, he was a minister. He said that Robert E. Lee told him in Lee's personal reminiscences, which Jones authored, quote, after the evacuation of Petersburg, a friend had given him a new prayer book. And upon this saying that he would give his old one, that he had used ever since the Mexican War to some soldier. This is a Old and New Testament Bible published in 1824. And five days before the surrender at Appomattox on the retreat, ladies and gentlemen, from Petersburg, Virginia, it was captured by a member of Company E of the 1st New Jersey Cavalry Regiment. And today, it is in the National Civil War Museum. All what you'd like to know, Robert E. Lee prayed over this Bible. Wouldn't you like to know what he said? I sure, I sure would. (laughs) The Confederate columns are going to leave outside of Fredericksburg, Virginia in early June. We know that General Ewell's column will be the lead. Of course, A.P. Hill and Longstreet's men following. By June 27th, 1863, the lead elements of Robert E. Lee's Army in Northern Virginia are where? Carlisle, Pennsylvania the very place that Richard Yule had trained as a cavalry officer uh, in the, the, before the American Civil War. Robert Rhodes' division, about 8,000 men here at Gettysburg, largest in the Confederate Army, will camp three of its brigades on what is now the U.S. Army War College grounds. One of the brigades will be camped at Dickinson College, and the fifth and final brigade, the brigade of Edward Ashbury O'Neill's brigade of, of, of Rhodes' division, will camp about a mile south of Carlisle on the road to Gettysburg, U.S. Route 34. When you drive up to Carlisle today, you would pass very near to where O'Neill's campsite would have been. One of the young soldiers in O'Neill's column, right at the beginning, right before the Battle of Gettysburg, was a man named Peter Marber. And this is, this is his picture. This is an unpublished carte de visite of Marbury. And as you can see, he was born in uh, North Carolina. That's near Raleigh, Durham. is where he was from. When he was about two years old, he moved to Greene County, Alabama. That's on the Mississippi border. That's in central and western Alabama. And in 1860, he's listed in the census record as a bookkeeper from Mobile, Alabama. He joined the 3rd Alabama Infantry Regiment in April of 1861 for only 12 months service, and immediately his term of service will be extended. This regiment saw extensive action at Seven Pines, at Malvern Hill, at Sharpsburg, and of course at Gettysburg where it suffered severely fighting at Oak Ridge on July 1st, uh, 1863. We're going to talk a little bit more about that uh, in just a few minutes. He wrote a letter from Carlisle on June 28th, three days before the Battle of Gettysburg. This is an original copy of it in pen in his own hand. I find it fascinating to learn what we can learn from this letter written just a couple days before the battle. He wrote it to a cousin named Cora. We don't know where Cora lives, but we know from the internal documentation in this letter that it is probably very likely 
She lives in Alabama where this man is from. Once again, Greene County, Alabama. That is a heck of a long way from Carlisle, Pennsylvania, ladies and gentlemen. And what does he say in the beginning of this letter, dear cousin? Your letter of the 10th came to hand this morning, and now I attempt to answer. What do we learn from that? The Confederate Army is getting what while they're in Carlisle? They're getting their mail. As a matter of fact, they got their mail. It took 18 days for him to answer a letter that he just got that morning from Alabama. And this actually went via Richmond because we know that his address says Army of Northern Virginia, Rhodes' division, O'Neill's Brigade via Richmond. So only 10 days for that mail to get up there. The Postal Service is working well, even in the Confederacy here at the outbreak of the war. And he says, I expect you will be somewhat surprised to see that we've succeeded in getting this far into the enemy's country. I can hardly realize myself that I'm here. Our Corps, General Ewell's, left camp at Fredericksburg on the morning of the first of this month and have been marching almost every day in the Valley of Virginia. We captured about 6,000 prisoners and came very near to getting Milroy, who was in command of all the Yankee troops. Had we got him, he would have been immediately shot on the account of the conduct he had toward women and children. Isn't this an interesting <laughs> Confederate letter? He goes on to say, it's hard to judge where we're going. Some say to Baltimore, and some say we're going to Harrisburg, which is an 18-mile distance to this place. I expect we will have a huge battle up here soon. The next letter he writes, which the museum also has in its collection, was written on August 7th from Orange Courthouse, Virginia. And he said, I received a letter from you while at Carlisle and wrote you very shortly in answer to it. It may be that you did not get it. He goes on to say, I feel very thankful that I've been spared so long and hope that I may live to see the end. I will not attempt to give you the history of our stay in Pennsylvania. I know that you've heard all about it. We fought the Yankees three days and held the battlefield. I consider that we whipped them, but was, comp was compelled to fall back to get provisions and ammunition. The Yankees, of course, claim a victory, as they always do. <laughs> What's that tell you about Confederate morale? That's pretty interesting, isn't it? Two letters never before published related to the Battle of Gettysburg. Unfortunately, Marbury will not live to survive the American Civil War. On June 1st, 1864, while skirmishing outside Bethesda Church near Richmond, he'll be shot in the right leg. His leg will be amputated. And on June 8th, 1864, he dies at Chermbrazo Hospital in Richmond. Never before seeing his family again back uh, in Alabama. Well, we know that these columns for the Confederate Army begin to converge on Gettysburg. And we know on June 30th, 1863, Union General and the Cavalry, General John Buford, will ride into Gettysburg at the head of 2,900 men. General Buford, a Southerner born in Kentucky but reared in Rock Island, Illinois, was said by General John Gibbon of the Federal Army to be the best cavalryman I ever saw. There's a description of Buford, which I think is outstanding, from Theodore Lyman, who happens to be a staff officer of General Meade's. And he said, Buford was a compactly built man of middle height, was a tawny mustache, a little triangular gray eye, whose expression is determined not to say sinister. His ancient corduroys are tucked into a pair of ordinary cowhide boots. From one pocket thereof peeps a huge pipe, and the other is fat with a tobacco pouch. Notwithstanding this get-up, he is a very soldierly man. He is of good-natured disposition, but not to be trifled with. Caught a notorious spy last winter and hung him on the next tree with an inscription that said, This man is to hang three days. He who cuts him down shall hang the remainder of the time. What does that tell you about the discipline of General John Buford? You know what he did when he rode to Gettysburg on, the, on June 30th? He got here about 11.30 in the morning. One of the first things he did when he rode into Gettysburg is he went to one of the three newspapers here in Gettysburg, the Star and Banner's office, and he had printed this. I have never seen one 
in the flesh until I got to the National Civil War Museum. This is a printed order issued by General John Buford on the 30th of June, 1863, right here in Gettysburg. And it says the sale of spiritus liquors of any kind in this town during the occupation by the troops is strictly prohibited. You'll notice the last line. The giving away of any liquor will be punishable the same as if sold. Same as if, as if of sale. Does that fit what you just heard about Buford hanging that spy? And anyone who cuts him down is going is to hang, hang there the remainder of the time. Buford did a splendid job here in the Battle of Gettysburg, we all know. Unfortunately, General Buford did not live like Mulberry. We just talked about to see the end of the Civil War. In December of 1863, he was taken ill. His probable cause of death was typhoid, although there are many other, other uh, uh, causes that are listed for his possible death. When he was on his deathbed, he was told by cavalry leader George Stoneman that for his conduct in gallantry, in gallantry service at the Battle of Gettysburg, he would be made a Major General of the Volunteers. At Gettysburg, he is only a Brigadier General of Volunteers. So they fired off communications to the War Department to try to get Buford a deathbed promotion to Major General of Volunteers. Buford did not believe it. He first asked, is it true? And they told him, yes, it is true. And then he reportedly said, it is too late. Now I wish I could have lived. He died on December 16, 1863. His commission was backdated to July 1st, 1863. And it was signed by President Abraham Lincoln and Edwin Stanton on June 15, 1864. Almost six months to the day to get through government channels after Buford had died. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the actual commission of John Buford that I just spoke of. This is the real thing. It is his signature right there on the right hand corner, or, or I should say his name, John Buford. And it is one of the commissions that is in possession of the National Civil War Museum. We actually have two of John Buford's commission. And you can see a scan of this at the new Seminary Ridge Museum that just opened on July 1st. They actually borrowed that artifact, had it scanned, and put it on display there. How many copies of that would exist? Probably about two or three. There would have been one that would have given to Buford himself. There would have been one that would have gone into the War Department files. There may have been an extra one for a clerk or something like that. This is one of only a few that you could count on a single hand of original copies. And the signatures on it are original from Edwin Stanton and Abraham Lincoln. We have many commissions at the National Civil War Museum, and I laid out four of them a couple days ago from four different presidents. We have four different presidential signatures on the commissions that we have there, which are pretty interesting. We all know that Buford's men collected great intelligence. They delayed the Federal Army. General John Reynolds' men came up on July 1st, fought the Army out west of town. The Union 11th Army Corps arrived north of town and, and fought the armies there throughout the afternoon. That July 1st, about 18,000 men killed, wounded, or captured just from the combat on the first day's battle. One of the heaviest areas of fighting was the fighting along Oak Ridge, where the second division of the Union Army's First Corps, under the command of John Cleveland Robinson, participated there. On July 1st in the afternoon, a brigade under the command of Alfred Iverson of North Carolinians will strike the right of the Federal line there. One of the federal regiments participating in that action was the 88th Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry Regiment, and one of the men in its ranks was this man, Edward Lyons Gilligan, a Philadelphia native, only 20 years old at the time of the battle. He was a clerk before the Civil War and a member of Company E of the 88th Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry Regiment that's there. While his troops were lined up along that ridge, Iverson's men, about 1,400 strong, went to attack the line of the Union Army. John Vaudier, the historian of the 88th Pennsylvania, said Iverson's men with arms at right shoulder came on in splendid array, keeping step in almost a perfect line. They reached and descended a little gully or a depression in the ground and moving on ascent to the opposite slope as if on brigade drill. Seconds later, the Union Army defense will unleash all the infantry fire upon that line. 
And a, the accounts we have say that Iverson lost about 900 men there, approximately, on the first day's fight. Hundreds fell on the first volley. Members of the 88th Pennsylvania jumped out from behind their protective wall that was right behind where the slope is. They have a monument just near that position today. And they ran out to capture prisoners. Gilligan followed Captain Joseph Richards of Company E. And Gilligan later said a Confederate pluckily held onto the colors and only gave them up when I reasoned with him with the butt of my musket. <laughs> Gilligan struck this man with the butt of his musket. And for that act, ladies and gentlemen, John Vaudier and the members of the 88th Pennsylvania put him in in April of 18 or 92 for the Medal of Honor. He did, he did not know he was going to be placed in for this decoration. John Vaudier and the members, hey, would you give us an account of what happened? They took that account and they sent it to the U.S. War Department. This is Gilligan's account written on April 4, 1892. It is in his own hand. And you'll notice at the top of it, it says Philadelphia, Wilmington, and Baltimore Railroad Company. He lived in Oxford, Pennsylvania, over near Philadelphia. He died there in 1922. And he says, I don't deserve credit. My hand never touched that flag. But his Medal of Honor citation reads for assisting in the capture of the flag of the 23rd North Carolina Infantry Regiment. And what's at the National Civil War Museum, his actual Medal of Honor. This is his Medal of Honor. My friend, licensed battlefield guide Gary Roach could come up here. He's in the, the audience today. He could tell you much more than I could about the medal. I believe this is the 1896 design of the Medal of Honor, if I, if I have that right. And on the back of it, it is described for gallantry at Gettysburg, July 1st. 1863. This is an actual Medal of Honor of the ones those received. There were 71 in Gettysburg in the Gettysburg campaign issued for action here uh, for Gettysburg, and this is one of the original ones. Not only does the museum have the medal, we have Gilligan's presentation sword, a wonderful presentation sword. The inscription up at the top says, as a mark of respect for the men of Company E of the 88th Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry Regiment. And the date on this sword is March 1865, given to him uh, at, uh, after right at the end of the war. One of the reasons why I like Gilligan so much is he's a humble man. He said, I didn't deserve that. I will receive it as an honor of the men that I fought with, those that fought and died, and the men of my regiment here. What a beautiful, what a relic. Someday I want to bring that back and stand on Oak Ridge and hold that on July 1st. Couldn't do it this year. Maybe I'll do it at another, at another anniversary. Well, we know that the Union forces, despite the gallant stand of the soldiers, that they were defeated on July 1st. Confederates drove them through the town, west and north. The Union Army occupied Cemetery Hill, which is over here behind me, near where we're sitting, and where we're sitting. And then Robert E. Lee has to form a plan of operation, ladies and gentlemen, for July 2nd, 1863. One of the first things that Robert E. Lee does is he sends out early morning reconnaissance teams to check the federal position on July 2nd. The best well-known of these is a reconnaissance team that he sent under two officers, Captain Samuel R. Johnston of Robert E. Lee's staff and Major John J. Clark, an engineering officer attached to James Longstreet. These men were supposed to get down toward Little Round Top and find out where the end of the Union Army was located. They came back to Robert E. Lee. They said that the end of the Union Army was not down that far. We know now that it probably was. And Robert E. Lee's whole plan of operations for July 2nd is based on this, at least for that end of the battlefield, based on this reconnaissance done early in the morning. One of the men present with General Longstreet at the time of this battle was an English observer. For those of you that saw Gettysburg the movie, you know Arthur James Lyon Fremantle was an English observer, came over from England, and was with the Confederate Army here in the Battle of Gettysburg. Arthur Fremantle was born in November of 1835. He's 27 years old here during the time of the battle. His father had been a major general defeating Napoleon on the Iberian Peninsula during the Napoleonic Wars. Fremantle attended Sandhurst Military Academy and graduated there in 1852, and he was a member of her Coldstream Guard, Her Majesty's Coldstream Guards. 
He entered the Confederacy through Mexico in April of 1863, traveled through Texas, Louisiana, Tennessee, and South Carolina, and caught up with Robert E. Lee's headquarters in Berryville, Virginia on the 22nd of June, 1863. He then went to General Longstreet's headquarters where he arrived on the 27th of June, 1863, just four days before the start of the Battle of Gettysburg. This is a picture of Colonel Fremantle of His Majesty's Coldstream Guards and his diary entry for the 27th of June. General Longstreet and his staff at once received me into their mess and I was introduced and he lists the following officers. You skip down a little further, you will see I have highlighted in red Major Clark, all excellent good fellows and most hospitable. That is John J. Clark, the one who went on this reconnaissance team with Captain Johnson on the morning of July 2nd. Fremantle was with the Confederate Army during the retreat and at Hagerstown, Maryland, after the Battle of Gettysburg, uh, he crossed lines, went over to the Union, and was in New York City for the draft riots. On July 15, he took a, took a steamer, went back to England on July 15. His diary, called Three Months in the Southern States, was published just a year later, in 1864, by a publishing house in uh, Mobile, Alabama. Somehow, and I don't know how, Major Clark gave to Fremantle after Gettysburg, he would have had it made, but probably before the fall of 1863, a desk piece. I want you to look closely at this desk piece. This is an artillery shell mounted with an eagle on top of it. And what does the inscription say? The inscription says, to Lieutenant Colonel Arthur Fremantle, honor and comradeship, Major J.J. Clark. This is an actual presentation gift. I can't tell you if it ever got into Fremantle's hands, but it was to be presented to Fremantle by Major Clark. Major Clark became a lieutenant colonel in March of 1864. And since his rank is given on here as major, it is very likely that this piece was a piece that was given or sent to him in England, or would have been sent to him. Luckily for us, it was not uh, sent to him uh, for the fall or, or of 1863 or winter of 1863. So you've got here an actual desk piece that was going to be a presentation gift to Arthur James Lyne Freeman. Now we know in that reconnaissance on July 2nd, Robert E. Lee doesn't know the position of the Union Army line. He finds out later on, guess what? The Union Army line is a lot further to the south than what I expected. How far south is it? Devil's Dan and Little Round Top. We know that Dan Sickles, we're not going to talk about Sickles very much here today, but we know he left that position on July 2nd, extended that line, and Little Round Top was undefended. General Gouverneur Warren, the engineering officer of the Army of the Potomac, went up to the hill, and aid was sent to the bottom of the hill, and Strong Vincent's Brigade, composing the 20th Maine, one of the regiments there, fought there. They're going to need some help. And General Warren himself, according to one account, according to Porter Farley, the adjutant of the 140th uh, New York will meet on the rear of General Weed's column and will bring up the regiment of the 140th New York Volunteer Infantry Regiment led by Colonel Patrick H. O'Rourke. This is an image of Patrick O'Rourke. He's got, his birthday is given as 1836 and 1837. I gave it here as 37. Came to the United States in a, when he was about a year old and settled in Rochester, New York. First in his class at West Point. You all know the story. Number one, Custer was dead last in the same class. I think some of you probably know that. And in September of 1862, he's going to receive a volunteer commission. He's killed on July 2nd. When this unit was marching to Gettysburg, when it got up onto the battlefield on July 2nd, Porter Farley says this, after marching about two hours, we halted in the regiments of our brigade formed in the column of division. It was while here waiting that an orderly brought to Colonel Warwick a circular addressed by General Meade to the Army. This is the famous circular that General Meade issued on June 30th, the day before the battle. They're receiving it here on the 2nd after it's gone down the chain of command that every soldier needs to do his duty. At the very end of that circular, General Meade says, Corps and other commanders are authorized to order the instant death of any soldier who fails in his duty at this hour. 
West Pointers are not habitual speech makers, Porter Farley says, and our colonel was no exception to the rule. But the order just read explicitly directed all commanding officers to address their troops, explaining to them briefly the immense issues involved in this struggle. In obedience to it, then and there sitting on his little brown horse in front of the regimental colors dressed as well as we all remember, his soft felt hat, long white gloves, military cap, Patty Orwart made the first and only speech to which he ever addressed to his regiment. It was short and to the point, and he said, quote, I call on the file closers to do their duty, and if there is a man this day base enough to leave his company, let him die in his tracks. Shoot him down like a dog. Now, this is a faded object that we have in the collection of the National Civil War Museum, but it is the very gauntlet that Patty O'Rourke passed that order over to P Porter Farley. This is the gauntlet O'Rourke wore at Gettysburg, and it was the gauntlet that O'Rourke was killed in on July 2nd, 1863. We have the right gauntlet. I don't know where the left gauntlet is, but this is the right gauntlet that belonged to Colonel O'Rourke. A few minutes later, he dismounted off his horse, along with Porter Farley, his adjutant. They gave the horses to the sergeant major, and on an attack leading the 140th New York to reinforce Vincent's brigade, Colonel O'Rourke was struck through the throat and instantly killed. He's buried at Holy Sepulchre Cemetery uh, in Rochester, New York. That fighting at Little Round Top will go on till about six o'clock. At near five o'clock in the afternoon, fighting will begin in the wheat field in the left center of General Sickles' line. The Third Corps line there needs help and elements of the Union Army Second Corps and elements of the Union Army Fifth Corps are gonna be rushed in to try to shore up the Union defense along that line of Sickles' command. One of the units that go into that field will be the first division of the Second Army Corps, commanded by a Vermonter born in Lowell, Vermont by the name of John Curtis Caldwell. This is the banner, this is on display at the museum, that Caldwell carried at Gettysburg. This is his actual division flag that went into the wheat field on July 2nd, 1863. One of the brigades of his command contained the 64th New York Volunteer Infantry Regiment and attacking through the wheat field in the early evening of July 2nd would have been this man, Henry V. Fuller. Henry Van Arnhem, Henry Van Arnhem Fuller. This is a albumen print of Captain Fuller of Company F of the 64th New York Volunteer Infantry Regiment. As you can see, ladies and gentlemen, Captain Fuller at Gettysburg was 22 years old. He's married in December of 1864, and he was from Little Valley, New York, Cattaraugus County, New York. That's in Western New York. At age 17, he was in the lumber business. He rode flatboats down the Allegheny and Ohio River, down to Cincinnati, down to Louisville, to sell timber product. He told somebody in his hometown that after the war, he wanted to enter in the legal profession. He wanted to be a lawyer there. He's commissioned as an officer and fights with this unit on July 2nd. We have an eyewitness account of his death given to us by George Whipple, a member of his command who was actually captured on July 2nd, 1863. A year after the Battle of Gettysburg, Whipple is released from Belle Isle Prison, and his local newspaper actually interviews him. He says this, quote, Sometime after five in the afternoon, we had orders to fall in and move to the left. We got over a stone wall, and after the rails on the top were thrown off, we started through the fields of wheat up to our waist. Here we got some stray bullets, Halfway through the field, we got a full volley, and we replied with our first shot. I stopped behind a clump of trees while loading my gun, and another soldier near me was struck by a bullet in the forehead. He fell against me. Cap Captain Fuller said, never mind, George, forward. We made for the crest of a little buff in front occupied by the enemy and got there lying down and firing. Captain Fuller was just a little in advance on the right of Company F, in between some rocks, firing at some rebels, colors where the orders came for us to fall back. We started back, and as Fuller rose to his feet to move with us, he fell wounded. He was actually shot in the leg. 
I helped him up. One of his legs seemed useless. I had a hold of him on the left and someone else assisted him on the right side and we made several rods to the rear. But at that time, an enemy bullet struck Captain Fuller in the back and came out the front under my arm. Struck him right in the right lung and came right out of the back, right out of the front portion of his body. He did not live very long. And we know from the account here that Whipple actually put him down, tried to stay with him. But then, unfortunately, the Confederates came and captured him. In his right breast pocket was a tactical manual. This manual stained in his own blood from that bullet wound on July 2nd, 1863. That is in the museum collection. I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, if you hold that and you don't have to change your clothes after holding that, you don't have a pulse. Because that is the real thing. An artifact surviving this battle 150 years ago to the day this past July 2nd in the breast of a soldier killed in the Battle of Gettysburg. Captain Fuller is one of the few officers of his rank that you can actually go down and see his monument on the Gettysburg battlefield. There it is. Here's his grave in Little Valley, New York. We know from an account of the regiment that his body was actually buried near the George Weikard farm. Somehow it was then reinterred and brought back up to Little Valley, New York. His son was about a year old, just a little bit more than a year old at the time of this battle. And uh, he later became a druggist. Here is a, a child that grows up without a father because of the second day of the Battle of Gettysburg. This object, of all the objects in the museum, everyone asks me what my favorite one is. It's hard as the chief executive officer to have a favorite object, but of all the objects in the National Civil War Museum, this one is my personal favorite because I just think it tells a real story about the sacrifice of the men that was here, who were here on July 2nd, 1863. Now we know, fighting there on the second day's battle, that the Union Army actually, uh, actually loses uh, the fighting down there on the second day. We know on the morning of the third day, the Union Army is going to perform a reconnaissance down there with one of the troops, the 2nd Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry Regiment. The Union Army leaves on day two, they come back. Who's in the trenches over at Culp's Hill at the right end of the Federal Army? Well, the Confederates are. One of the soldiers down there is this man, Charles. Reading Mudge. Mudge was from Swampscott, Massachusetts, graduate of the class of 1860 at Harvard. That's the same class as Robert Gould Shaw, Colonel of the, of the uh, um, 54th Massachusetts. Mudge will get an order on July 3rd to attack Confederate forces across the Spangler Meadow. Very famous what he says, it's murder, but it's an order. He'll be going across that meadow and he's killed in action on the third day of the battle, very early in the morning on July 3rd. He probably ate his last meal with this mess kit. This is Mudge's actual mess kit. It has a salt and pepper shaker in the center. It has a knife, fork, and spoon that fold open, and only a graduate of Harvard and an officer right could afford such an item. How many soldiers you know have something that look like that? How do we know it's Mudge's? Because it has his name inscribed on it. That's his actual name, Charles Mudge right on there. Who does he attack? The elements of William Smith's brigade and the elements of George Stewart's brigade of North Carolinians. George Stewart's brigade, the 3rd North Carolina, one of the regiments in his command had lost a flag at Chancellorsville. They lost a flag on July 2nd at Gettysburg. And members of the Cape Fear Guards, Company A of the 3rd North Carolina brought out their own little tiny color and they carried it on the 3rd of July. It was this color, a very rare company level flag carried at Gettysburg. And it actually has a note on it, if I can get to it, that talks about the history of this flag ending up in New York and then finally going back to one of the men who ended up capturing it, ladies and gentlemen. This is a company level flag used at Gettysburg and extremely rare. So we have some flags, not a lot, but this one, this one I think would be some of the rarest of the rare here. We know that the Federal Army will get back the trenches on July 3rd, right? The Confederates will have to vacate eventually. Fighting is over there, goes up till about noon. And then we have Pickett's Charge on July 3rd, 1863. One of the regiments in that command 
was under the leadership of this man. Lieutenant Colonel Riley W. Martin. Colonel Martin was a physician. He commanded the 53rd Virginia Infantry Regiment at Gettysburg, and he is the only regimental commander of Armstead's brigade to survive Pickett's charge. Four of the five regimental commanders were killed. Martin is wounded right next to General Armstead, shot through both his legs. Taken to the Second Army Corps Field Hospital here at Gettysburg, he writes this letter, dated July 9, 1863. It is the original letter in his own hand to his father. He says, I do not suppose you will be allowed to come see me. I should make all necessary arrangements for my body to be taken care of so that it may be buried at home when it can be. He doesn't expect to live. He dies in 1912 in Chatham, Virginia. He survives the Battle of Gettysburg. This is an original letter written by Colonel Riley Martin. When he attacks the federal line at the angle, he's going to overrun the troops belonging to Lieutenant Alonzo Cushing, a young 22-year-old officer of Battery A, 4th United States Infantry Regiment. Here is a picture of Cushing, born in Wisconsin, reared in New York, Graduated from West Point in 1861. Cushing will be struck in the shoulder, hit in the stomach or bowel area, and will stay next to his guns while Lewis Armstead and Raleigh Martin lead those troops, about 150 of them, over the wall, capturing some of Cushing's guns. Cushing is shot through the open mouth and killed by a Confederate rifle bullet right where he stood on July 3rd, 1863. There are several great pictures of Cushing. Here is one taken in September of 1862. I want you closely to look at his belt. He has a Model 1851 officer's belt buckle with a standard leather, leather belt. Let me get you another image of it. Here is a close-up image of it. You can see the loop on the belt. And there is the belt in the collection of the National Civil War Museum. As far as I know, ladies and gentlemen, this was the actual belt he had on his person when he died at Gettysburg. How do we know that? Because there is his name inside it. Right there. Now we know that the high water mark of the Confederacy, the Union Army, will be victorious there, ladies and gentlemen, but not before the sacrifice of all the troops we just talked about, Union and Confederate here, on the first three days of July, 1863. You just toured the Battle of Gettysburg as quickly as we could do it. Some places we call that, as one of my colleagues would say, a drive-by shooting. You just had it. Ladies and gentlemen, the three days of the Battle of Gettysburg through actual artifacts. I would encourage you to go in this museum and look at the artifacts. Hopefully you can come up and see us at the National Civil War Museum. You can Google and you can find us. Unfortunately, I have not left much time for questions. I want to thank you all very much for coming out today. It was my pleasure. Thank <laughs> you.